Welcome back to the 24 hour live stream of Nothing But Net with the Michelle Smith. Smitty, it's yes. so great to see you. Absolutely. Love being here, Debbie, and everything that you do. So this is this is awesome. I mean, I gotta confess, like there, you know, I love women's sports. So there's a lot of basketball players I've enjoyed and, and and love being around and covering. But Smitty and Mia Ham are the two that really take it to another level for me. Like it is so fun to spend time with you guys. Um, and especially to spend time with you. I've always enjoyed my time with you, even though it might be short sometimes, but um, you have such an infectious attitude about everything that you do, Smitty. Where's that come from? You know, I think just gratitude. I'm very, you know, I'm, I just feel very blessed in my life. I, you know, had really supportive parents that put me in sports. Maybe it was, you know, because, um, you know, I was a busy body and they just kept me in sports because it was uh, <laughs> something to, to burn off all that energy. But, you know, I just feel like there's opportunity everywhere. And the more that you give and share with people, um, the more it, you, it gives back. I apologize. This is Emmy, my dog, who loves to play oh, yeah. ball. And of course, she's wanting me to throw her tennis ball at her. But, um, you know, I think that's really where a lot of it stems from. And and I've had uh, the opportunity that sports has given me to travel the world, meet people all over the world, live in another country. And I think when you get to experience those things, you realize how blessed we are here in the States and um, with, with all the different opportunities that we have. I mean, you raise the credibility of everything that we're doing because you donate your time to us so that we can, you know, spend some time with you, which is great. Um, and, you know, let's just talk about where women's sports is right now. I'd love to get your take on the explosion that we're experiencing. And isn't it about damn time? That's what I say. It's about damn time. I mean, women's sports has always been um, fun, right? I just don't fun to watch, fun to be a part of. I just don't think the American public realized it as much because we got such a small percent of newspaper, um, you know, columns, back in the days when it was all about newspapers and then when it came to tv we you know we, we didn't get a lot of tv time so there's just so many things that we've had to battle but now that we have uh viewership now that we have eyeballs on it i think pe people realize just how special women's sports are and did it take someone like caitlin clark and um south carolina and uh, you, you know just all the amazing women that we've seen at the collegiate level I mean, Team USA basketball has been outstanding in the Olympics, right? Since what was it, the 70s when when basketball was a full medal sport yeah. for women. So it's been there. I just think it's been a great awakening of the American public that women's team sports, not not individual sports, not golf and tennis, but women's team sports are just as much fun to watch as the men's team sports. And now that people understand that, I think and hope that it will bleed over into, for instance, softball. You know, we've had great ratings on television. We've had the opportunity to um, do a lot of really magical things in our sport, but we need an aha moment like uh, basketball and Caitlin Clark and all the, the amazing people that have been uh, involved uh, in women's basketball. We need that for softball. So I'm hoping that that's next. Yeah, I, I mean, I've called it Clarkonomics. That's what it is. I mean, it's a rising tide, right? Everyone is going to make money off of the new experiences that people are having, whether it's in arena or watching on television. It's a magnet for those that want to compete and want to see somebody excelling at the highest level. And everyone benefits from it. So it's amazing. I do believe softball and other sports. I see a an uptick in gymnastics. There seems to be a, an uptick in volleyball. Um, when Nebraska can put 90,000 plus in a football stadium and Iowa can put 55,600. I was there for that event. Oh, that's that awesome. Crazy good, right? I mean, I wanted to be there because I wanted to experience what that felt like. You know, you and I, we've been around so long. We've been waiting for that. What, how do we sustain it? Like people ask me that all the time. It's not a moment. It's not a movement. There's some sustainability power here. What would you say to that? Yeah, for sure. And that's like anything that is um, is going to be a value. It is the sustainability of it. It's not just one and done. And so I think that uh, we need to continue to move women's sports forward, as you mentioned, in all capacities. So 
basketball, volleyball, gymnastics. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, those are all the Olympic sports, right? Those are all the sports that people love to watch every four years. So why shouldn't they love to watch them every year, right? Um, and so I, I think a lot of it is going to tape forward thinking. And I think that's where for softball, I'm, I'm always trying to get facilities built because we're the only female sport that cannot play in a men's facility. So that hurts us at the professional hmm. level. We need we need facilities. We need stadiums. We need the ability to have a professional environment to have a professional league. And I think that we're getting there. I think now that there's a lot of public money being spent on all facilities, men's, women's, um, you name it, NFL, MLB, you know, on and on and on. We need to ask for a piece of that pie, right? Otherwise, otherwise we're going backwards. So I think it is, the you have to be a visionary. You got to be thinking five and 10 years out. And so for, um, you know, women's basketball, they need to continue to i think grow the league I'm, I'm i'm glad to see that hopefully there's going to be more uh, w uh, nba teams and more of the men's programs or owners um or professional athletes that want to buy into women's sports i think that's a lot of it because that adds credibility so i think there's probably a hundred different tangents that you can go in from a business perspective but the key is is that it's not a flash in the pan that you know if yeah. you do things the right way it's going to continue to grow so, you know, you and I, we're, we're invested for the long haul. We've been invested for a long time. And I was recently reading a story about a sports management professor who studies economics and studies sports and was talking about the difference in the amount of investment on men's sports versus women's sports from men, not women. And right. how do we get women to get more involved in seeing the return on investment? Because I don't know about your house, but, you know, in my house, like, we're making the decisions about everything, you know, sure. um, whatever um, decisions there are to be made when you have a family. And so I, I think it's really powerful to, to find women that can find a return on investment. And it's all about business. The only color here that matters is really is green. Yeah. It's green, <laughs> right? I mean, people want to make it into these other things. And I keep saying, no, it, it's got to be economically solvent you got to forecast forward you got to figure out like you said i did not even put that together that softball was the only sport that's not can't play in, you can't play in a major league baseball stadium that's really an interesting how, how are you moving that forward because i know you're involved in so many things on the softball yeah. side so you know oklahoma city has a um with hall of fame stadium has a facility that is um gotten some public money we need facilities we, we what we need is people at the top of our sport to realize that the economic engine that softball brings to a lot of local communities counties and states that bed tax money because these these traveling tournaments there are thousands sure. of dollars of room night tax that is getting um that is infused into these communities and it's not getting reinvested back into the sport of softball and that's the mistake now we're starting to see how the NFL, MLB, all those are going to communities or going to states and they're asking for help, right? They're asking for that bed tax and all that help um, because of the, the economic engine that they are. So softball needs to do the same thing. For example, Eddie Seymour Fields here in Clearwater, Florida, where we hold the ESPN Invitational, yeah. that facility does over $50 million a year in economic impact to the city of community. Just that one facility, $50 million economic impact. So that what we need to do and what I'm doing is I'm asking Pinellas County, I'm asking the city of Clearwater to reinvest back into softball and basically upgrade those facilities. So we need other communities to do that. And like my first thought, which is to me a no brainer, and I don't know why other people haven't jumped on this, the Titans, Nashville is going to spend about $2 billion building them a new stadium and all sorts of uh, commercial, real estate, apartments, hotels yeah. around that facility. My whole thought is get 1%, ask for 1% and build a community softball stadium in Nashville, have it a private public relationship between Vanderbilt, oh, by the way, the only school in the SEC that does not have softball. <laughs> <laughs> Vanderbilt and Nashville, the city of Nashville have the private public relationship. Vanderbilt uses that stadium because they don't have room 
so they say on campus to build a softball facility so they use that facility the sec could then use that facility every year for the sec tournament yeah. and guess what people will want to go to that because yeah. nashville's destination they're not just going to be going for softball i mean and are you running for governor uh, somewhere because i'm voting i mean i i 100 hear what you're saying i get it it makes total sense especially when you have the data to back it up 100 percent. and so the economic engine that women's sports are, even at the youth level, we need to uh, capitalize on that. We need to, at every level, basketball, volleyball, you name it, for these young girls, the money needs to be reinvested back into women's sports. And so I think we're finally at the, the point where we can have those conversations and people sit yeah. back and go, oh, yeah, why are we sp yeah. spending billions of dollars on men's professional sports only? Right. Oh, yay! We can go watch a, a Madonna concert in the facility they're going to build. You know, for the Titans. No, uh, we need facilities for women and for girls yes. to play in. See, that speaks. Money talks. Yeah. It's yeah. that's the bottom line. It's not always about equality or equity or when, when you're dealing in economics and you look at it like that. That's what I always say about coming to the table with the right economic forecast and being able to advance our game and our sport that is so important for leaders on the top right and i mean i don't know i mean are you the commissioner of softball yet because you should be i mean i'm listening to what you're saying and i'm all in i mean i'm 100 percent like i get that and now i'm thinking about my own community you know what is in mount pleasant south carolina what is in charleston we are a destination city we have like we have a huge tourism base. Nashville has a huge tourism base. I hear what you're saying, Michelle. It makes 100% sense yeah. to me. Yeah, absolutely. And, oh, and then, yeah, and that's what we need. We just need people to really think of it in a different way, not like the costs associated, but the opportunity associated. And then the loss of opportunity if if, if we don't move forward and we, we, aren't, we don't start thinking, as you said, you know, um, with the, the color of money. And then it, it comes to like, if you build it, they will come, right? That old cliche, which we've seen time and time again is true. And so spinning it towards Special Olympics, it's the same principle here. It's exactly what we're doing, right? We're trying to raise some money to provide opportunity to train, organize, compete, socialize, all the things that Special Olympic athletes cannot do on their own. And they need leadership to be able to do that. And they need some money to do that. You have... Um, not only support us with your time, but you have invested in what we're doing as well. And I'm so grateful because sure. it's it's it can be a gift. It can be a donation. I look at everybody that helps us as an investment because you're investing in people. And that's an so important part of what we're doing. 100%. And, you know, um, I, I love the Special Olympics because, as you said, it's a community of, of people, of individuals that just need a little help. And when you give people a little help, it's amazing what they can accomplish. And it's amazing the joy that they can help share with other people. And that's what we need in this world. We need more joy. We need more <laughs> sharing. You know, we need people to realize that we are 99% the same, right? We all have two eyes, two ears, a nose, two arms, two legs, right? But we find the 1% we're different and people like to argue about that, but let's look at the 99% that we're the same. Let's spread joy. Let's help lift other people up. And I think when you do that, you just end up feeling, uh, living a much more fulfilled life. I am hitching my wagon to everything, Smitty, Michelle Smith, all of that. I mean, I'm jumping in right now. I mean, move Beth Mullins to the side, slot <laughs> me in there. <laughs> Our dear friend and colleague, Beth Mullins, who's a, who we both uh, deserve a medal for having worked with her for so long. Uh, I say jokingly. Um, she's a, a great friend and supporter of our event as well. I want to ask you about the Olympics. You did bring it up. Obviously, you're one of the most decorated Olympic athletes we have in the history of our of our country, not just softball. Thank you. And you're so well respected in every aspect of what you do, where you go, and especially when it comes to softball. What are we going to do about the Olympics? It's tough, especially for softball and baseball. You know, we're in, we're out, we're in Tokyo, we're not in Paris, we'll be in LA, hopefully we'll be in Brisbane. Um, you know, it's it's tough for us because we just need to continue to grow the sport in Europe. And if we can get the European, um, you know, communities to understand how great the sport is, I think we'll have a better chance of staying on the program. Um, 
you know, I, I think when we are on the program, we always need to put our, our best foot forward and start to continue to, to start to grow the game further in Europe, because there's a lot of young girls over there that need the opportunity to play the sport, to realize how much it teaches them. It's a team sport. There's a lot of individual aspects of it. Um, so, you know, the Olympics, I think they're doing as much as they can to really try to appeal to um, the younger generations that are different than our generations or generations before that really had you know, we're, we're glued to um, the traditional Olympic sports. So, you know, I, I, it's been a little bit of a battle. It's easy to sometimes be depressed about it, but I think we just have to be forward looking and be like, all right, we're going to take the opportunity to, to grow our sport and hopefully be better next time we're in. And that will be LA. And oh, by the way, we could use a, a new stadium in LA. So hopefully we'll get one there for the Olympics. <laughs> Well, we got to start working on that right now. I'm with you. Yeah. Let me know where you need me to drop off flyers campaign, put some signs up, whatever you want, because whatever you're running for, I'm I'm in. Um, I want to ask you about the international scene since you brought it up, because in college basketball, we have a lot of players that come over here that are international players and in other sports, but you don't see that as much as in, in softball. Well, how do we grow the sport you're in, in Europe? And if you need somebody to come and shag fly balls, field a grounder, turn two, I can still do all those things for you to help you over there. Yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, we do need to recruit, I think, more uh, youth out of Europe to come over out of, um, you know, some of the countries. I think the language barrier at times is a little bit of a struggle. Same thing with Japan. And so there are a lot of Japanese um, young women that would love to come over and play in the U.S. system collegiately, but there's an issue with, with the language barrier. Ironically, though, once our women graduate here, the best pro league in the world is over in Japan. You know, I played over there for 16 years and that's where our, our best women are going over, you know, now to continue to play and, and further their careers in softball. But, you know, I, I think it's, it's like everything. And now with, you know, the Google machines, you can bet you can have a translator right here. So you, you do start to learn the, the languages um, a little bit easier, but you know, I, I think for everybody too, it's easy to stay glued. It's easy to stay close to home. Um, it's hard to take that big leap and potentially move halfway around the world. But I think it, you reap benefits when you do expand your horizons and you realize how the rest of the world lives. You know, it teaches you obviously lessons on the court or on the field. But when you can walk down a street and meet people that you would have never met before that speak a different language that maybe look that 1% different than you do for, you know, what, where, whatever country that you're in, um, you start to realize that we're still 99% the same. <laughs> is your statue in the United States or in Japan? That's what I want to know. Where is the Michelle <laughs> Smith statue? It, Cause you're 16 years. I know you've referenced it a lot. It, tell us a couple of things that you learned maybe about your time in Japan. You've already referenced a few. I'll tell you the, the greatest blessing of being in Japan was living within um, their culture and learning their culture and the respect for uh, the elders in their society. The fact that they are a nation, half the population of the US. So let's just say they're about um, 180 million people. They live in a country that is physically the size of California. So it'd be like everybody west of the Mississippi moving into California. That's how densely populated they are. So you realize to look outwardly. You do, in the U.S., we're always ha that that person cut me off, and or that, you know, how's everything affecting me? We're very in. We we look always at ourselves and how life is affecting us. In Japan and in that culture, you're taught how are you affecting the environment? How are you affecting your neighbors, your teammates, um, you know, your family? Uh, so you learn learn to look outward and realize the footprint that you are leaving and. Um, and so it just makes you think differently. It makes you, I think, much more compassionate. You know, maybe the person that just cut you off is racing to the hospital to see a loved one or whatever. You know, it makes you realize that life isn't, you know, just everything revolving around you. There's just so much more going on. So I, that to me, that was the greatest blessing was just a lot of the cultural aspects. And, you know, that's been a very male dominated society that has been very progressive over the years to, um, to get women more involved in a lot of different areas. They still could do better at management level in a lot of their corporations. Um, so there's, it's just like everything in life. It's a growth um, period. But I think a lot of it too, is just the ability to realize that if, you have to sacrifice some things. If you want to be good at something, you're going to spend not just the quantity 
quality of time, but the quantity of time you need to spend to really dedicate yourself to something. Which is exactly what Special Olympics is. It, it, you just summed it up for us and put it in different context from the Japanese culture to what Special Olympics really is all about. That is a perfect segue and transition. You're pretty good at this TV stuff, lady. You got to transition. No, you do. <laughs> So great to have you with us, Smitty. You're so awesome to give your time. Once again, I'm so grateful. Uh, we 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 just love what we're doing here in year six. You know, we're coming uh, up on a million dollars and uh, we're anticipating being over the million dollar mark when we're done shooting free throws. So thank you for everything. Absolutely, David, my pleasure. Go Special Olympics and come on everybody out there. Let's, let's support them. Let's support them. <laughs>